good morning and welcome to the very first flagship addiction, uh, uh, edition of the Breath of My Ancestors radio show. I'm your host, Ty Gray L, and I just want to say that I'm happy to be here. I will let you know that Breath of My Ancestors radio will be bringing back nostalgic old time radio theater in that I will be telling stories about our historic contributions to this country and to the world. Um, there is an international need for more positive images of African American ancestry, particularly as it applies to youth and young adults in America. Uh, low test scores, high dropout rates, escalating substance abuse, mounting reports of irresponsible sexual promiscuity, Soaring incidents of crime and violence along with disproportionately high incarceration rates have become almost commonplace within the African American community in more than 100 major cities across this country. So what I'm going to attempt to do with this show is to dispel some of the myths associated with our history and see if you know, I can get us to learn to love ourselves a little more. Learn, learn to love ourselves a little better. And uh, it must be emphasized that this kind of conduct is not normal. Uh, it does not reflect the character of black people in America. But in fact, this uncharacteristic behavior can be directly associated to a designed method of creating low self-esteem and little to no interest in higher education. This show will focus on the storied accomplishments of African Americans and highlight their achievements through poetry, storytelling, music, and interviews. The show will serve as a catalyst for change in the mindset, not only of African Americans, but the world at large. The show's mission is to raise self-esteem among black people throughout the diaspora and thereby uplift all of humanity. And I welcome you. Thank you for being here this morning. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I'm going to be doing uh, throughout this show. Um, again, I said it's a mix of throwback radio theater. I don't know if you guys remember, but, well, some of you remember. But the soap operas that we see on television today, most of them actually started on radio. I remember as a little boy, I used to sit around under the feet of my grandmother and my grandfather. And we would gather around the radio and just listen to the stories. Uh, Guiding Light, and uh, General Hospital, uh, those types of shows used to actually come on the radio. As a matter of fact, I remember listening to The Lone Ranger on radio. And so what I'm going to be doing is bringing back a touch of that I will try to stimulate interest in African-American history by revealing little-known and often neglected historical facts about our people. I'm going to showcase great leaders as role models to motivate young and old to higher achievement. I'm hoping to improve race relations by dispelling myths of racial inferiority because we got a problem in this country. we got a problem with ourselves. We need to know who we are and whose we are. I'm going to support and work in conjunction with other organizations seeking to improve the social and economic status of African Americans, period. And I, and I want to thank uh, eLife Media for uh, hosting me on this show and Dr. Baruch for uh, seeing enough in me to say, come on, Ty, let's just do this. Because we need a voice well, we need more voices talking about the problems in our community. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about is the, the disproportionate high rates of incarceration. Uh, I wrote a poem. It's called One Degree of Separation. And I wrote this poem called One Degree of Separation because there's a huge disparity in, in this country with respect to who goes to jail and who does not. And so our former president, George W. Bush, was at a, uh, he was at a soiree, sort of a business meeting among all of these elites. 
and he I remember him saying he was happy to be there among the haves and the have mores. <laughs> and I thought that was interesting. But one of the comments he made was um, he was referring to incarcerated people and formerly incarcerated people as those people. And it dawned on me, you know, you had two daughters, my Caucasian brother, who had been incarcerated. It dawned on me that the former president before him, Bill Clinton, had a brother with a cocaine conviction. It also dawned on me that in this country, there's only one degree of separation between anybody else who has been locked up and anybody, and anybody else around the world. Just think about it. There's, a, there's an adage that says there's six degrees of separation between anybody uh, in the world. So that is, if, if I were to go to, say, Nigeria today, or if I were to go to Zimbabwe, or if I were to go to Bahrain, anywhere, that there's what somebody would know somebody that I know, and there's only six degrees of separation between those who know somebody. So uh, my engineer, Reggie, today, if, if we start talking, if we keep talking, we will find that there's only six degrees of separation between the folk he knows and the folk I know. I submit to you that there's only one degree of separation between anybody that's been locked up in America and anybody else. And so I've shared this short piece with you called One Degree of Separation. There's a problem in our communities, and someone must step to the plate. Because there's a whole population that could credit this nation. We must reach them before it's too late. We are labeled ex-offenders, labeled at-risk youth. But what separates you from me? It's a simple opportunity. And we must come to grips with this truth. Because America's founding fathers were fathered by ex-offenders. And the record reflects we are all suspects. We're a nation of great pretenders. So this may cause some trepidation. And you might not like this observation, but between you and me, there's only one degree, just one degree of separation. And I share that with you because we, we need to step up to the plate and we st need to start recognizing that we live actually in an incarceration state. America has been in the business of incarcerating its people uh, for quite some time. Statistics will show us that we, per capita, have more people locked up than any other nation on earth. As a matter of fact, uh, when we looked at the numbers, we find that per capita we have more, nation, more people locked up in this country than uh, they actually do in China. China has more people, it has over a billion people. And we have more people incarcerated here than they do there. It's, uh, it's amazing. And so, and the reason for this is, in my belief, is that we're, we're not really visiting the issues that face us today. We're, uh, we're in denial. And denial is the longest river. So, it's my suggestion that we start paying attention uh, to the facts of the matter. And again, the title of this show is Breath of My Ancestors. And the reason why it's called Breath of My Ancestors is because we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors brave. And we're no longer Negroes, no longer slaves. And we really need to embrace the fact that our ancestors are the reason for us being here. Uh, it, and we run from that. We don't even want to hear anything about our history. We are we are afraid of the most important in my mind. Now this is the you know, opinion of this show host, but in my mind, the the most important part of our history that is when we came through chattel slavery, we run from. We 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 don't even want to talk about it. And I realize it was really painful. And there's a 
uh, a measure of understanding around that. But we have to get to the knowledge that we have to get to the knowledge that if not for those people, we don't even exist. We have no bearing in this country or anywhere else if we don't embrace that particular part of our history as painful as it may be. And so I'm going to introduce to my listening and viewing audience the breath of my ancestors, reflections from the conscience of an African in America. I got to tell you a little bit about my story. This particular show will only have me on it because I'm just introducing myself and letting you know how I got here, how we come to be addressing each other at this particular time. And it's been a crazy roller coaster ride. So, historically, I was born and raised in the first all black public assisted housing project in this country. The very first one. A lot of people think it's in Chicago, a lot of people think it's in Detroit, but actually it's in Washington, D.C. It's a little place called Langston Terrace. It was the pilot program, the pilot project for public assisted housing in this country. Uh, it was built back in 1935. Uh, actually, the ground was broken back in 1935. They didn't start moving people in there until 1938. And so my parents moved in there in the 50s, and I came along in the 50s. And Langston Terrace was the catalyst for me actually being here. I lived the first 12 years of my life at 21st and Benning Road, for all of you who know where that is, uh, in Washington, D.C. And then the next tw uh, 13 years, I moved around the corner and lived literally over top of the Langston Library. And for... 40 years, I thought the place I lived in was named for Langston Hughes because living over the top of the library, Langston Hughes became my favorite poet. and uh, There was just so much around Langston that I thought that that's what it was named for. But actually, it was named for a brother by the name of John Mercer Langston who uh, was a prominent attorney, a uh, black attorney way back in the day. And Howard University's uh, law school is actually named for John Mercer Langston. And Langston Terrace was named for him. I share that information with you because coming up in Langston Terrace shaped and molded uh, everything that I have become. I, uh, when I was born, I was born with scarlet fever. And... Uh, I remember I had two brothers, actually, well, one stillborn, one never quite got here, and scarlet fever was the reason for uh, those two incidents. But I remember when I was a child, I had these bouts with scarlet fever, and so in my seventh year, I had the worst bout ever, uh, that is, my temperature went up to 104, and I was living at 2107 G Street Northeast, which is right at the corner of 21st and Benning Road. I remember this clearly, like the most vivid memory that I have. My mother was over top of me with an ice rag, had a, a wash rag with some ice in it. And she was crying her eyes out, man. And I remember applying the ice, and I remember leaving out of my body on a thin white thread and like I went up to the ceiling actually I went up to the ceiling in this direction and I remember looking over seeing all these wonderful beautiful colors I mean, it was lapis blues and turquoise colors beautiful gold and I didn't see any white light I saw this beautiful deep colored lights like magentas and verdant greens and just was beautiful and I said from where I was perched I said to my mother looking down at her ma 
stop crying. I'm not going right now. You're going to go before I go. And I remember distinctly her looking up to the place from where I was speaking as if she thought she heard something but wasn't quite sure. She did like this. And then she went back to attending me. I remember looking back over one more time at that beauty and descending back down that cord very, very slowly. And the next memory I have, I woke up in D.C. General Hospital. And they say that I had literally passed away and, and come back. And I share that story with you because I come from really humble beginnings. And then moving forward, at the age of 12 years old, uh, I was, uh, no, I got to tell you one other story about my grandmother. This was also when I was seven years old, which this provides the impetus for what I'm going to be sharing. I will be sharing um, throughout my radio career here, my TV career here. And that is that the cream shall rise, uh, coming from those humble beginnings. My grandmother, Thelma Teresa, Miss Polly Johnson, everybody called her Miss Polly. My grandmother taught me this really strong lesson when I was seven years old. I remember she sent me out on the porch to get the milk from the porch because a lot of you young folk today, you know, won't be aware of this, but milk didn't always come in, you know, in your homogenized plastic packaging that you pick up from the 7-Eleven and the Giant and the Safeway stores. Milk came in bottles, and the milkman actually delivered the milk in bottles. I remember distinctly he wore (laughs) a white hat, white shirt, white pants, white shoes, and in a white truck, and delivered white milk. I remember that clearly. So this particular morning in spring, I'm seven years old, my grandmother sends me to the porch to get Two quarts of milk. It was a Saturday. I know it was a Saturday because on Saturday she always got two quarts because that's the day she baked. So I go get the milk. She uh, she takes one of the milk bottles of milk and sticks it in the ice box because it wasn't a refrigerator then. It was an ice box. She sets the other on the table. She says, boy, tell me what you see. So I say, I see milk, Grandma. What are you talking about? She said, pay attention. Tell me what you see. I'm looking. I'm trying to figure this lady. What is she talking about? Um, So after two or three minutes of serious staring, seriously staring at this milk, I realized that there was a line at the top. And it was darker at the top than it was at the bottom. So I said, Grandma, there's a line in it. She said, that's right, son. That's the cream. So I said, okay, I'm seven years old, cream. I, I love cream because we used to get the pet milk and the carnation milk, which was the cream was sweet. So I, I, you know, I knew about that. So she then takes the quart of milk, shakes it up, and sets it back on the table. She said, now tell me what you see. So I look, and the line is not on the top any longer. It's uh, shaken up. It's in there, right? So I said, Grandma, you just shook it up. It's in there. What do you mean? What are you you asking me? She said, pay attention. She put that thing in her voice. You know how your grandmother can do. She put that thing in her voice. Pay attention, boy. So I'm looking, paying attention. I said, lady, what are you talking about? It's milk. After looking at that thing two or three times, I realized that the line was back. So I got got excited. I'm like, Grandma, that's magic. How'd you do that? How how, How did you make it come back like that? What did you do? She said, it's not magic, son. It's natural law. Cream is the essence of the milk. It's the sweetest part of the milk. It is also the darkest part of the milk. And I want you to understand something about yourself. You are the darkest thing in this country. You are a race man. She used to always refer to me as a race man. She didn't like the word colored. She didn't like the word black back then at all. And, of course, 
the N-word was one of the things that she detested. She said, you are a race man. And you need to understand something that right now you're on the bottom of the society. But if you get your learning, get your learning, one of these days you will rise up and become something special and do something special for your people. And I remember that lesson, man. I forgot about it. Honestly, I just totally got out of my head until I turned 40 years old. And one day I sat up and I realized I remember that whole episode vividly and i was like grandma wow the cream shall rise so i wrote this poem in loving memory of thelma Teresa, miss polly johnson my grandmother it's called the cream shall rise listen african diaspora and you shall be told of your glorious history in the days of old when you were kings and queens of commerce and trade, when the tubs you bathed in were gold inlaid, when your bodies were covered with the finest silk and you drank from silver goblets the sweetest milk, when your bedposts were made of oak and the finest cedar and the world sought advice from the African leader. Yeah, listen, dear children, and you shall hear how you sailed the seven seas without any fear. How you gave the world medicine and cured those ill. How you constructed awesome pyramids with your mighty will. How when some of the world's people were living in caves, your cities had street lamps and the roads were paved. Why, when some were scared of fire and thought the world was flat, you had smoke coming from chimneys and globes on floor mats. How you wore the finest rubies, diamonds, and pearls, and filled the universities with your boys and girls. How you introduced writing so that mankind could read. And concerning arts and science, Africans took the lead. Yeah, listen, good people. And you shall know how you gave the world splendor a few decades ago. How you built the Sphinx. And how you swam the Nile, then sailed up and down it to relax for a while. How you marched through storms and war, defending God's name, then wrote the laws of anatomy to contemplate your frame. How you were the first people to develop speech, then you created griots so you could learn and teach. Yeah, listen, my people, check your history. Recall, you, you carried the torch that lit the way for us all and try to remember as you go through life's maze that one of these good old glorious days you'll be back on top for the cream shall rise just as sure as the sun lights the eastern skies. The cream shall rise. That's in loving memory of Thelma, Teresa, Miss Polly Johnson. Doc, you called in to uh, talk to you. Okay. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, and uh, it seems I have a special caller on the line for this flagship show. Uh, So go ahead, caller. Uh, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Brother Ty Gray. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Baruch, man. Good to hear your yes. voice. Yes, sir. And, and, and welcome to, you know, the team. And we appreciate your, you know, participation on this, on this journey, this continuation of both of our journeys as we, as we join hands and work to elevate the level of consciousness and motivation and power that we know is present in the cream. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, I, I mentioned, you know, that I appreciate eLife Media and appreciate you for thinking my work worthy uh, of, of, of your circumstance. So I'm, I'm here, man, to 
to just, uh, you know, lace up my boots. <laughs> You know what I mean? Put my back against yes, yours and let's just go ahead and do this thing. Because, you know, we're in trouble, man. We're in trouble. And you've always been on the, uh, the you know, on the battlefield, so to speak. And I'm just happy to be here with you, man. Um, we, You know, this, this work that you're doing is essential because they've destroyed us through media. They, yes. they and, 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 and so uh, we know the truth of it is, you know, you, you, fire, you have to fight it with fire. So the only way for us to get back uh, and get the messages out to the people that that will help them and then ultimately sustain them is through media. So, you know, I yeah. appreciate what you're doing, man. Uh, thank you for having great. me. Great, great, brother. Well, we appreciate you and the great work that you've been doing and we're, we're honored to be able to amplify your voice and your spirit and your energy out into the universe so that people will know that you know breath of my ancestors has a home and breath of my ancestors you know can be heard 24 7 you know the way we're going to set it up they're going to be able to listen to you 24 7 but I, again i just appreciate you and i wanted to welcome you and thank you for uh you know trusting in us and what it is that we're doing because there's a whole lot of people that that are doing something, you know, yes, but I appreciate you for trusting us and, uh, and joining hands with us and, and, and making this journey a lot sweeter for us yes, as we sir. seek to, uh, you know, make a difference. You know, well, I appreciate you, media is important. Yes, sir, I appreciate you. And listen, uh, just as a brand new uh, radio talk show host, I realize that we have to pay bills and we're coming up on the 930 hour, so we're going to take a break so we can do that. And I hope you come back on the other side of this thing so we can keep it going. Well, I got to I gotta be there. So I'm going to have to break off. I'm going to try to meet you in the studio. <laughs> okay, that'll work. That'll work. Okay, we got to pay some bills okay. right now. We'll be right back. E-Life Media. with less than perfect credit? Or do you know anyone that simply wants to raise their score significantly? How about anyone who just wants to establish their credit? Well, look no further. FES can help. We are the number one restoration service in your area. We're affordable, really affordable. And we are proven to give you results because we all know what can happen when you have low scores from disapprovals, turndowns, and just bad karma in your life. We fix things such as removal of late payments, charge-offs, collections, foreclosures and bankruptcies, repos, student loans, tax liens, and judgments. Now to get started, just call Ahmad Gray at 240-381-3695 or you can visit us at 6178 Oxon Hill Road, Oxon Hill, Maryland, Suite 301. 
or visit us on the web at www.myfes.net backslash agray3 and that's A-G-R-A-Y-3. Then click products, then under FES protection plan, enroll now. Give us a call today at 240-381-3695. Welcome back to the Breath of My Ancestors show here on eLife Media. Uh, I'm your host, Ty Grayell, and I'm happy to be here. If you are interested in calling in, please call 240-455-5934. I would like to take any of your comments or questions. Again, 240-455-5934. We'd be happy to take any of your comments or questions. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes. We would love for you to go to the App Store. If you have an Android phone, go to the App Store and download the eLife Media app. Uh, we need your support. Go to the App Store, download the eLife Media app. If you have an Apple, I mean, if you have an iPhone on the Apple platform, uh, you have to go to... I think it's you have to go to either iTunes or wherever the app, wherever you get your your apps from, on uh, on uh, with, on the iPhone, and then download the eLife Media app from there. And if you want to hear us live or see us live, go to UStream right now. You can go to UStream right now. Um, go to the eLife Media page on UStream, and you can pick us up there. And then, of course, after the show airs, you'll be able to go to. Uh, eLife Media on YouTube and pick us up. So, again, the Breath of My Ancestors show is uh, going to be bringing you spoken word poetry. Uh, This is the flagship edition. And so I just wanted to kind of, on this flagship edition, introduce myself to you. And, of course, we'll be bringing on guests uh, and we'll be highlighting issues of the day. But I just wanted to introduce me, Ty Grayell, to you initially, um, just so you know who I am and where I came from and why I'm doing this in the first place. So I tell you about my grandmother during the first segment. And my grandmother was a quasi Gaviite. When I say quasi, she wasn't trying to get on the boat and go back to Africa, but she used to instill all of this. Uh, these Garveyite type principles into me, like do for self, know who you are, know where you came from. She's she's talk about Songhai, 
Mo- most of her family members didn't wasn't aware that she talked to me about this stuff because uh, it, it was for me. It, it was for me. She used to. I remember my grandmother had you know several grandchildren, but she used to catch. I used to catch her staring at me, and and she would always have these little intimate conversations. She talk about Song High and Molly and our storied accomplishments at Timbuktu and talk about Nubia, Kemet, Africa. And she instilled this this thing in me. And so several things uh, occurred, you know, during that, you know, the cream sh- after the cream shell rise piece, of course, I grew up in the hood and I watched the hood deteriorate. I watched it go from uh, a project to a reject that is Langston Terrace. And any, if any of you know, well, if any of you grew up in a in a public assisted housing project where they're primarily black people, it's the same story across the country. So, you know, if you grew up in Cabrini Green or Huff or, uh, you know, Wayne, any of them, it's, it's the same. It's, you know, uh, Calliope down in New Orleans. It's like, Every, it's uh, it's the same, and I watched my neighborhood grow, f- turn from a, a project to a reject. Like I said, and so I wrote this piece. Uh, Langston Hughes wrote a poem. Langston Hughes wrote a poem, and in the poem, he talked about deferred dreams, and in it, he said. Um, he asked the question, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Or maybe, maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it just explode? What happens to a dream deferred? And that question, you know, Ran around in my head. I told you Langston was my favorite poet. Uh, most of his work just reached down in my soul and and touched me. And thinking about Langston Terrace and where I grew up, a few years later, a few years after uh, I left there, you know, I realized that my dreams were deferred while living there. So I wrote this little short poem called deferred dreams I dreamed of a home where the grass was green my neighbors were happy and pleasant but I woke to streets of asphalt so mean only fear and despair were present my dream was deferred I dreamt the schools taught children to think and the system encouraged our youth upon wakening curriculums didn't have the missing link, and some books taught lies, not truth, yet another deferred dream. I dreamt the crack never entered my hood, and the eyes of my people were clear, but I woke to merchants up to no good selling $5 rocks right here. Still another deferred dream. I dreamt King Heroin lost his throne, and my folk regained their pride. But I woke into projects hooked on bone. and My pride was set aside. Still another deferred dream. I dreamt that murder was a thing of the past and weapons had disappeared. But I woke to a generation dying fast with gunshots loud and clear. Still another deferred dream. Finally, I dreamt it was all a plot. And my deferment was contrived. But when I woke, the reward I got was the knowledge I had survived in spite of my deferred dreams. (laughs) In spite of my deferred dreams. Let me share another piece with you. It speaks to our circumstance today because we act, you know, in this country, we're in denial. <laughs> we act like the things that went on before 
have nothing to do with what's going on today. And all this murder and all these killing, which I will be dealing with during the course of this show. Um, but right now, I'm just trying to introduce myself so that you'll know that I have some qualifications uh, for what I am talking about. I want to share with you an excerpt from this book it's called Where I Came From. Where I came from, we weren't absolutely certain we would eat every day. Sometimes roaches would ascend and descend up and down the radio pipe in the Miss Sally's house. Ma said the roaches came from Miss Sally's house because she was nasty. Where I came from, grass was something we saw on the high school football field. Grass. Where I came from, if the liquor stores located on every corner were closed, you could always run down to Mr. Jack's joint and get you a half pint. Where I came from, first base was Miss Betty's Buick. Second base was the lamp post. Third was the fire hydrant if the cars weren't coming. And home plate was the same cement square you played hopscotch in when you were playing stickball. Where I came from, Pookie was accepted. He'd get drunk. And pass out right on our tenement steps. And all we had to do was suck our teeth and step over him. That's all we could do was suck our teeth and step over him. And Mr. James, Mr. James was a genius. He could book the numbers without paper nor pencil. Genius. Where I came from, courage and valor were equated with insanity. Don't mess with smoke. He crazy. He already killed two people. He crazy. Where I came from, flowers bloomed in the pots of very few folks' windows. Where I came from was like a jungle, and sometimes I do wonder how I kept from going under. Where I came from, jail was like a rite of passage. You seen Junebug? He looking good, ain't he? You know he just came home. Where I came from, we'd mostly hide from the truth behind the tinted glass of a whiskey bottle or in the contents of a hypodermic syringe. Where I came from, women weren't respecting us men much because somehow, for some reason, we weren't respecting ourselves. Girl, if the government catch that man in your house, they going to cut your check off. What's more important? The money or the man? What's more important, the check or the man? Girl, you better get that check. Where I came from, most of the men had lost their ambition somewhere, and the majority never found it. Matter of fact, where I came from, the women were raising the boys. Most of the men were beaten or broken or gone. Where I came from, education was secondary to survival, or maybe thirdary, or maybe even fourthary. Where I came from, drug dealing was socially accepted, because some people misinterpreted the phrase by any means necessary. Sometimes I wonder if it's my fault where I came from. Sometimes I wonder if I came from somewhere else. Would I be as strong as I am today? You know where I'm coming from? Yeah, I hope that resonates with some folk because uh, we truly do come from humble beginnings, the most of us. Uh, we're up from slavery. And we're coming through several epochs in our evolving so we come from slavery through uh, so-called Reconstruction, Jim Crow, and civil rights, and, and now human rights. All of these, all of these 
episodic time frames. Uh, we we really are the strongest people on earth. The African in America, so-called black man and woman, strongest people on earth. Matter of fact, I know I'm going to alienate a whole lot of people right now by saying this, but the black woman, in the estimation of this commentator, is the strongest person in the history of the world, black women, especially African-American black woman. And I say that because she has endured absolutely every single possible anything. I mean, I, I, my, I, you know, as a wordsmith, I'm at a loss for, for, for the words to talk about how strong the black woman actually is. So I think we got a caller. Um, go ahead, caller. I'm listening to you. This is uh, your brother, Ty Grail. This is your brother, Rock Newman. Rock, bro, my brother, man. You know what? Let me just tell you something before you say anything. I am planning to launch a flagship show uh, in, uh, you know, a real launch. And you were the first person I was going to call to ask to be the first guest on my show, brother. I'm not making that up. <laughs> well, let me ask. I mean, are, are, are we on the air now? We're yes, sir. Uh, we, well, yeah. here's, what I, here's what I want to say to your listeners. That they should tell every one of their friends, their family, to listen to Ty L. Gray. Mm-hmm. I refer to Ty L. Gray as the greatest spoken word artist in the history of the world. <laughs> yep, that's what I said. That's what I said. This man, this man has a depth and a brilliance that is unmatched. He just hasn't been fully discovered yet, but it's only a matter of time. <laughs> Ty L. Gray has a cornucopia of spoken word talent that is going to be sprinkled on everybody. So tell all your <laughs> friends and family... Lottie, Dottie, and everybody. <laughs> tell it to the hot, tell it to the old. <laughs> tell it to the young. <laughs> I appreciate you, Rock. That's what they need to do, Ty. Congratulations, man. And you have won. If don't nobody else listen, you have a loyal follower in me and your little buddy named Monty. <laughs> oh, man. Monty is my buddy, man. I, hey, you don't even know this. I, I'm going to tell you something. Every time I came over there, after the first time that I came to your house, every time I came, I bought a little sneak treat. I ain't even want you to know. I bought I bought her a bag of treats and gave you the whole one, but I ain't let you know I had a couple of them in mine. And that's why she that's that's why she that's that's why she uh, loved me so much. I think because I <laughs> yes sir. Hey, but Rock, hey, let me just say this, man. Um, man, listen, I, I put on my website something you said, man. You said. Ty Grail is the uh, uh, heavyweight spoken word champion of the world. And I put that right. quote out there because if that coming from you, brother, having having uh, managed the heavyweight champion of the world and been around all of the heavyweight champions, um, that was special, brother. So, I, I, man, I appreciate you. I love you. Everything that you've ever done for me and our community. And your show. Um, uh, it's powerful, man. It's powerful. As a matter of fact, I just reposted on Facebook the show that you did with the what's what's the what's the European sister that does the work the, the um the race. Uh, uh, Jane, Jane Elliott. Jane Elliott. My God, my God! Everybody listening, please go and look at that. Look at the Rock Newman show with Jane Elliott. She deals with everything that we're facing in our society today, and she does it with courage. And your show, brother, I, I wish, you know, I, the same you wish I, for me. I, I, will, you know, I mean, I, I'll, I guess I'll take the, the liberty to try to get a shameless plug in here. Yeah, they can watch it all on the Rock Newman Show YouTube channel. Um, and I, I very much appreciate, you know, you, you, you mentioning that, man. And, you know, I was just on with Phil Advised the other day. It's called the Phil Advised Show. And we talked about how critical it is for our voices to be heard because they are being drowned out through the mainstream outlets. 
Mm. And, it, you know, every single day when we wake up, man, to the extent that we have something positive to offer to our community, it is so valuable, valuable, valuable to do so. And I'm so happy that you're on the, on the air because you got a lot of wisdom, you got a lot of depth, you got a lot of spirituality to share. And, mm. you know, you got a lot of information and mm. informed information. Mm. Um, uh, infused with action is what we need. Well, let me say this to you. I, I don't feel like it's a shameless plug at all. Matter of fact, I subscribe to the Rock Newman uh, uh, YouTube channel uh, and look forward to uh, everything that's coming on. Matter of fact, <laughs> uh, 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 another plug, and I don't think it's shameless at all. We need to plug everything that we're doing. Is um, yeah. I had a, I had a, I, I, my wife got a hold to 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 Dee Dee's the Beauty Enigma. I called myself. I said I'm gonna read it first. And next thing I know, I can't find the book. She didn't. She didn't. She, didn't, she, didn't, she didn't took the book. So I'm, I'm suggesting everybody listening to me. You know, go go check out the Beauty Enigma, man. Rock's wife, Dee Dee Newman, Demetria Newman, has written, uh, has done a yeoman's job. And to me, uh, her book, uh, it w will lead you to the fountain of youth, which is in our mind. And so I, I, you know, and I've only I've only read like the first forty some pages because my wife snack. I, I'm reading the book. I get forty pages in. Next thing I know, I can't find it. I, I guess I'm gonna have to order another one. Hey Ty, can can I tell you a little something personal about that? Uh, just between me and you. <laughs> um, you know, man, my wife and I, you know, we've been married thirty three years, and you know, for the most part, we get along fairly well. We get along fairly well. Um, we had one hell of a disagreement on something. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you quickly uh, uh, about it as you talk about the beauty enigma. One of the re what I wanted to do as a marketer and a promoter was to put my wife, a picture, a photo of my wife on the cover of the book because she is 67 years old and she is routinely mistaken for being 37, 38, yes. early 40, yes. or, 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 yes. or, or whatever. And so I wanted to say, and, and, and she's that way because she has practiced everything that she puts in the Beauty Enigma. So my position was, look, if people see you looking like you look at 67 years old and think that you're 37 years old, that's a hell of a sales suit. And you know yeah. what? I still think that's the case. She absolutely refused to put her picture <laughs> on because it is a book that, yes, it's called The Beauty Enigma, but it's a, uh, the art of ageless living from the inside out, out, uh, out, from the inside out. And she wanted this to be about something more profound than just exterior looks, exterior beauty. But she wanted it for everybody to find their own beauty from within. Mm -hmm. She refused to agree with me on that and mm. hey, it's her book so she got that call yes. um, but you know and so so again I'm so proud of her I read the book time and my reaction was oh my god why haven't I listened to her more all these years <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know hey look hey rock when you when you over on on, on uh, Martin Luther King Avenue eating that fried chicken how come you could Dee Dee's voice didn't pop back up in your head <laughs> I know, man. So listen, I, man. Listen, I appreciate you. I appreciate her, and you're right, man. Um, your 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 wife. I I, she, you know, I, she is. I, when you say 67, that's incredible because she she could easily be mistaken for 30, 5, 30. I mean, 30 even. So uh, obviously, she is uh, practicing what she's been preaching, and I I, I suggest to everybody listening. Um, to get the beauty enigma because it works on you from the inside and that's what we need man i, I suggest that this, this is what we need in our society man most of us have become so superficial and so um you know we, we we're just you know inundated with those things that are uh outside of us not understanding yep. that, that everything inside of us is what is where the real development is so kudos to her man and kudos to you brother all right, thank you, man. And, and, if, and if your listeners, you know, want to check it out, they can go to thebeautyenigma.com. She is allowing, she's so confident.
confident and proud of the value of the book and what it has that folks can go to thebeautyenigma.com and read the first chapter mm -hmm. for free. Just, just, just go there and check it out. We think you'll find uh, you know, it uh, to be of real interest, but it's the thebeautyenigma.com. They can go there and check it out, and uh, she'll have tips, you know, daily tips and that sort of thing. So thanks a lot, Ty, for... Even well, bringing I'm, that up, yeah, and I'm giving you, I'm giving you, and uh, well, I'm, I was gonna call on you anyway for for at least one of these shows, but I'm giving her an open invitation to come on this show. Um, uh, I think she'll like the platform, and um, you know, I I got a few followers out there, and I'm just hoping yeah. that they do themselves a favor, and 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 uh, and and open that book and apply the principles to it because I tell you what, I just I just got the book Saturday, came in the mail Saturday. And I literally read the first 10 pages and was changed. And I'm not making yeah. that up. I'm saying I read the yeah. first 10 pages and was changed because, oh, my God, you know, I never even thought of it this way. And I wish yeah. I had it in front of me now so I could actually pull up some. Uh, but here's again, open invitation for her to come on this show. And, any, and, of course, man, anywhere you are, whatever you're doing. Let us know, and we'll, we'll spread the word and hope that the breath of our ancestors spread this thing because we stand on, our, on their shoulders, man, and that's the platform that I'm using. And unfortunately, Rocky, you know how this goes. We have to pay some bills. We're at the top God of the you. hour. We're at the top of the God hour, you, and I appreciate you, man. God bless you. Bless Take you, care. too. That was my man, Rock Newman. All right, we'll be back after the break. Man, that was great for him to come. to eLife Media, where we play all genres of music, soul, jazz, gospel, and much more. Do you want to be seen and heard worldwide? Well, we're always looking for musicians, businesses, artists, comedians, and any talent you want to share with us. You may contact us on elifemedia.net or call Reg Gaskins at 240-832- 4455. We have a mobile app for Android and iPhone and on the net at TuneIn Radio. eLife Media is radio, video, and television. The ultimate media broadcast network. Listen to us on the web, download our app, or watch us on YouTube. eLife Media, the ultimate media outlet broadcasting live radio and TV worldwide. Powered by live music for you.
Welcome back to the Breath of My Ancestors show. I'm your host, Ty Grayell, on eLife Media. And um, I'm just happy to be here. I, you, you guys have no idea. I'm so happy my man Rock Newman called in. It blessed me up. My son got this new saying, bless up, bless up, Dad. And Rock just blessed me up. Um, coming up after me, uh, Dr. Baruch will be on um, with his show. I want you to stay tuned for that. Um, E-Life Media is doing some powerful things. Uh, uh, we uh, got the Keep It Moving show with Kim Robinson on Mondays from 11 to 1 p.m. And we got some powerful shows on here. Dr. Zamia is up on it, uh, up on it with Dr. Zamia on Thursdays, 8 to 10 p.m. And I'm not just giving it all to you, but there's uh, uh, DJ Drew is doing the Rush Hour. Fridays from 5 to 7 p.m. So we got a powerful lineup here at eLife Media. And uh, the term up and coming is apropos because we are up and coming. And what I want to share with you now is uh, basically how I got into this whole, the, well, I told you I'm going to bring you radio theater. And Radio, the, my concept of radio theater is just listening. You know, right now this is radio on TV because this is 21st century, and uh, eLife Media is not only just radio, but it's also TV. So this is, as a matter of fact, my engineer Reg Reg uh, uh, just gave me the phrase radio on TV, and I never thought about it that way, but that's what we actually are. But when I say bringing back radio theater, I'm talking about. For those old school folk who remember just listening to stories on the radio and how powerful they were and how influential they were. And I submit to you that this is how we got to where we are today, man, from the stories that people have been told. You know, uh, I've heard some very, very negative stories that keep us in a position of negativity, you know, uh, and so... I want to bring us some stories from our history that are based on facts, but I'm taking poetic license. Incidentally, they told me I was uh, ineducable when I was in the uh, seventh and eighth grade at Brown Junior High. And now I'm on the radio talking to millions of people. I'm on radio TV talking to millions of people. And I'm an author. And so I'm just thinking that was a story they told me that I was ineducable. And somebody lied about that. And so the uh, point is that we are influenced by the stories that have been told to us. We function according to the stories that have been told to us. And so I was asked to perform at a Kwanzaa event maybe six, seven years ago. And uh, at the event, the young lady who was hosting the event, it was a Kwanzaa event. I think it snow, actually snowed that night. It was a couple of days after Christmas. And a couple of people didn't even show up for the event. So she had time to kill. So she, uh, you know, I was there to do a couple of pieces of poetry. But in the middle of it, she comes up to me with this book called Bullwhip Days. And she says, Brother Ty, could you just read this story? But I got to kill some time. We need. I need your help. So I said, okay, no problem. I, I'll read the story. And, you know, I briefly went through the story before I stepped to the stage. And I read it. I was, like, blown away by what I read. And then when I actually read the story from the performance side of it, when I finished, the people gave me this rousing round of applause. And I was like, why are they clapping like that? Well, it seems I had actually gotten into character. The story that I read was about, this is a book called Boo Whip Days. I encourage you, go on uh, you know, Amazon or wherever you buy your books and um, pull up this thing called Boo Whip Days. Boo Whip Days is a, 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 a compilation book of stories of formerly enslaved Africans who, uh, a group of students from Harvard and Yale, went all around the Deep South gathered these stories up and uh, so I read one of them 
And uh, this was in 1928 and 29, I believe 28 through 30, uh, they gathered all these stories up from these formerly enslaved Africans. And the story I read was about a brother who was enslaved on a horse ranch in Texas. And when I finished reading the story, the people just went, they just went off. And so I went home that night uh, enthralled by the story that I read. And I went on uh, online and I, I actually went to Amazon. You know how Amazon allows you to read a portion of the book before you actually purchase it. I, I was consumed by it. I ordered the book immediately. I read several uh, short stories from it. And I was just, I couldn't get it out of my head. I went to sleep that night. 4 a.m. in the morning, I wake up. I wake up, Rich. 4 a.m. in the morning, I got this complete story about a woman by the name of Bathsheba Hempstead who was born and raised on a breeding plantation in Sumter, South Carolina. The woman had 23 children in 22 years. Her mother on the same plantation had 20 children. On the same plantation. And I, here's the thing though. Before I read it, before I read the story that I wrote, I had never heard of a breeding plantation. So I go do research. I found out breeding plantations all over the South. All over the deep South. They had breeding plantations where they would actually sire up the, the big John Buck with the woman to, for the purpose of making slaves. So I read that, I was like, oh man, I couldn't believe it. I read that, I wrote that story. Four or five nights later, I wrote another story. A week later, I sit both up right in bed, I'm writing another story. So to date, I have written over a hundred of these stories. And so when I say Breath of My Ancestors Radio Theater, I'm going to be telling you the kind of stories that I'm about to share with you now um, from the perspective of those people who actually live through them and Again, all of the stories will be based in absolute fact, although the characters will be my characters. I take poetic license the same as Steven Spielberg takes license when he tells his stories or any other storyteller who tells their stories. Uh, you know, I don't want people calling up saying, oh, Ty, you, you exaggerated that. So, for instance, I got a story about how... Even though we give the credit, everybody gives the credit to Thomas Edison for creating these lights, the electric light. Actually, according to my research and according to the story I'm going to tell, it was Louis Latimer. So, you know, you can beat me up if you want, but I'm telling the story from my perspective. There's an African proverb which says, until the lion is able to tell his story, the hunter will always get the glory. So... This lying about the roar. I'm just telling y'all now. That's what's coming. So, anyway, I'm going to be telling these stories from the voice of one Lightning Gray. So, the historical adventures of Lightning Gray, the Cakewalker, is the first in a series of stories written in the vernacular of those 18th, 19th, and 20th century African American pioneers who provided most of the ingenuity and most of the labor that established and empowered these United States. The dialect and expressions used in the storytelling combined with the factual data enhances the learning experience and stimulates interest in the historical contributions made by these early Americans. These stories are designed to raise self-esteem among African Americans in particular and people of color all over the world. This being my flagship show, I'm going to dedicate uh, these stories. So bear with me in this dedication. It is essential that I dedicate this series to loved ones, past and present, without whom any of this would be possible. So it is with great pleasure that I recall some of the names of those who have been instrumental in the creation of this manuscript. To my grandmother, Thelma Teresa Miss Polly Johnson, who taught me so many indispensable cultural lessons that I, I can't even, there are no words for all she taught me. 
to my mother, Mary D. Gray, whose capacity for love was unmatched and immeasurable. And my second grade school teacher, Miss Williams, who I am grateful for sparking my love of language. I spell the word getting, G-E-T-T-I-N-G. When I was in the second grade, that woman raved so strongly at my being able to spell that word uh, at seven years old that it still sticks with me today. And I've been a student of words ever since. It's also dedicated to my children, Kizzy, Danielle, Yushel, Jamila, Spenny, Nora, Ty, Sal, and Justin, who have sacrificed in ways that words cannot even explain. I thank you for being patient and understanding. I'm a, I have four biological children, but I actually raised eight. And so that's the reason for that long list. To my wife, San, who has sent... Uh, who was sent to me as a blessing from God. That's all I can say. She's been the rock of Gibraltar with the largest, kindest heart of anyone I've ever known. And to all of you who have been instruments in my development, whose names I uh, do not have room enough here to mention, I thank you. Thank you from the depths of my soul. I thank you, and I thank Almighty God for just allowing me to be here. Um, so, Again, I mentioned this earlier, but there is a, an international need for more positive images of African-American ancestry, particularly as it applies to youth and young adults in America, especially in the inner cities. Low test scores, uh, high dropout rates, escalating substance abuse, mounting reports of irresponsible sexual promiscuity, soaring incidents of crime and violence, along with disproportionately high cost incarceration rates, have become almost commonplace within the African community. Uh, this need is evident in more than 100 major cities across this nation. Dr. Joy DeGruy, who has conducted perhaps America's most thorough investigation of this behavior, has clinically proven that black people in the United States suffer from post-traumatic slave syndrome. She states, and I quote, post-traumatic slave syndrome, or PTSS, is a condition that exists as a consequence of multi-generational oppression of Africans and their descendants, resulting from centuries of chattel slavery, a form of slavery which was predicated on the belief that black African Americans were inherently, genetically inferior to European Americans. This was then followed by institutional, uh, institutionalized racism, which continues to perpetuate injury. And so these stories that I'm about to share with you uh, are coming from the perspective of making us feel better about who we are and where we came from. And again, before I share this first story, I want to set it up so you'll know what I'm doing and understand what I'm doing. I'm using the vernacular and speaking in the language that was taught to us. We spoke this way. You know, I heard somebody talk about Ebonics, and they spoke detrimentally about Ebonics, Ebonics being uh, an ebony, black form of the English language. Well, let me just say to anybody with any intelligence, that consider this. We've only imitated and emulated everything that we've seen here. So when we speak like we're from the South, deep South, and with a Southern drawl, that's because that's what we learned in the deep south with a southern draw. When we came here initially, none of us were speaking the, the language that we learned. So we adapted and adopted. And that's important for us to understand. When, when we learn to love ourselves, we got to stop beating up on ourselves for our circumstance. We got to stop beating up on ourselves for our condition because the condition that we're in is as a result, you know, the vestiges 
of slavery. If you don't know that word, look it up. Vestiges of slavery. Visit us today. That's why we keep shooting each other down in the streets because of the vestiges of slavery. But anyway, again, until the lion is able to tell his story, the hunter will always get the glory. This is the first in a series of stories. And you will be hearing all of these stories will be told by Lightning Gray. Lightning Gray will be the voice of our ancestors. But first, he's going to tell you his own story. My name is Lightning Gray, and I was born right yonder in Bladenburg in a stable over the Water Street. Yeah, Lord, 1800. I is 110 years old at this year talking. And for all the time that Tristan run through me, my mind still served me good. First clear memory I have was 105 years ago. I was five. I recollect folk making all such a much over that science fella what was named a Banneker, Ben Banneker. They all riled because he had written a letter to President Jefferson about abolishing slavery. I remember that clear because I see them myself standing right down on the wharf. I remember them French and them English start scrapping over this year spot. Right here on the river. When I was 12 years old, the war of 1812 it was. Seemed like everybody was mad with everybody. The Indians fighting with the French. French mad with the Brits. Them redcoats mad with the colonists. And the colonists mad with everybody, it seemed like. I remember that there's Anacostians everywhere. The Indians, they's everywhere. But they all gone now. Not a one left. Not a one. I recollect the Battle of Bladenburg. I was 14. Now, I was told that that's where that saying, lost our shirts, come from. The red coats come barreling down the wharf, come right through the shipyard, stormed down to the Washington District, and banked up everything in their path. I remember I see President Madison on a big black stallion. Prettiest horse I ever seen. Had all them blue coats around him marching. A wonder it was. I see a lot of killing. I remember there was a lot of dueling in Bladen Bay. I hear the folk come here just for that, just for the dueling. Blood run, they call it. That fella with the writ, that Spangle Banner, that Scott Key fella, his son killed over there on the count of some foolishness, dueling. Folk come here for them spa waters, too. People from all over the world say God had blowed his breath in them waters. They come from all over, sick folk, for the healing. I recollect that clear, like yesterday. Now, I was 16, the wall was over, and I was working the south end of the wharf. I was tying off some piling when I heard a boom, sound like cannon fire. And when I waked up, a bunch of folk, colored and white, standing over me. They was pouring water on my forehead. They was rubbing my shoulders and my feet and my arms. A boat the lightning tore up half the pier. They say them spy waters what brought me back. <laughs> and that's the day and folks started calling me lightning. <laughs> I recollect a lot of things. I recollect it was 18 and 32. Folks, it ain't hard for me to remember the year because they run right along with my age, you see. Born in 1800 and all. But it was 18 and 32, because that year I went to work on the rail line proper. We put down rail from here, clear to Baltimore. It's hard working, cutting timber, driving rail there. But you know what's my most happiest recollecting by that time? Was the Saturday night cakewalking. <laughs> Man, we, we have a high time. I bet y'all young today don't even know nothing about no cakewalking, does you? Most times was misery, though. Waking sun up, sun down, just misery. Rain, shine, snow, sleet, hair. I remember blisters. I remember blisters, back aches, bunion. 16 to 18 hours in the hot, scorching sun, just some misery. 
But Lord of mercy come Saturday night. The fiddler be fiddling and the banjo player be plucking. We be drinking mashing and they be cakewalking the beat all get out. I remember we had a big shindig when we finished the line over to Washington. That was 18 and 35. I remember that because they had been fighting the laws to get it over there. Before 1835, the line always stopped to Bladenburg. Wouldn't go all the way over to the Washington district. But I tell you something that I recollect that most folk done forgot. There's a lot of people died whilst we stringing up Master Moss Telegraph. I recollect that I was electrocuted about maybe at least four or five times. But I never uttered nary a word, nary a bit of it to nobody. It just give me, uh, it never bothered me. You know? It just give me like a tanger. But I remember Pinch Evan, though, he grabbed a whole double line. And that boy flopped all over the ground like a fresh caught chop. Baked his arm all the way to his shoulder blade. Smelt like a roast venison. There was most all the colors would put up that telegraph now. It was on this white men what was overseeing. Because they scared to touch them lines. But Master Samuel Moss come up with a code that let the trains talk from Bladenburg all the way to Baltimore. Most folks don't know this right here. Right yonder, first telegraph was read right here, Bladenburg, Maryland. I recollect Master Moss had a gray dapple. Pretty harsh she was. I sat her up for him one hot July morning in 43. All of a sudden, the sun went dark. And a storm come up so fast, you couldn't turn. A bolt of lightning struck the hitching post, knocked me and the gray to the ground. Took the horse a spell before she got up. But I jumped right up, looked up to the Lord in the driving rain and thanked him. I think he heard me when I thanked him, because that was more than 60 years ago. And my memorizing better now than it was on the day he run his tristy to me. <laughs> Yeah, I tell you something most folk don't know. It ain't never was spoke about much. But there's a lot of slaves that escape slavery through here. When people be talking about the Underground Railroad, I have you to know that it run right through Bladenburg. Had you ever heard of Henry Box Brown? That fellow would ship himself to freedom in a box from over to Virginia. Well, it's told to me. And I couldn't lay my hand to the good book on it because it's only taught to me. But there is a folk of swear that he shipped from Port Tobacco over in Marlboro. Come over on a flatboat over the Water Street where he put on a schooner over the Baltimore. And that was the spring of 49. And let me tell you one other history fact. I worked on the rail when the first electric train come through here. First try run done right yonder on the Bladenburg track. In the year I lawed, 18 and 67. I remember the year because they run right along with my age, you see. But I recollect they just started using them newfangled batteries. And the train speed would reach almost a 20 mile an hour. <laughs> a lot of fellas would die using them newfangled batteries because all you need to do was touch it wrong. I'd electrocute it about maybe leave five, six times, grab and hold of them thing. But the Lord let me live. Now there's one day. I never won't forget as long as I live because of the glory attached to it. The day of Jubilee, President Lincoln had signed the paper, see. I recollect it's a fine spring day in April of 62. Little Hollis Harvey used to fetch things from over to Washington from time to time. Little fella. He come galloping down the main road on a big brown mare. It's strange because you ain't see much of colored men uh, riding no horses back in them days. But he's standing straight up in the saddle shouting, we free, we free. He done signed the emancipation, we free. Man, you talking about some cake walking and mashing drinking that night. I recollect the rail station shut down and everything. We had a high time. It may have one of my most proudest ponderings. And when we opened up our own African Method Church, we all tired of having to sit up yonder to the galley to hear a word of worship. Peanut galley, they call it. White folk ain't want us to worship with them. So after spell, we start our own church. Dick Chapel, it was. Sit right yonder. And that's on this about 10 years back. 
In 1900, it was. I remember the year, of course, they run right along with my age, you see. But Pastor Abraham Dent, mayhap the preachless man I ever hear, that man could preach a fire out of brimstone. <laughs> I remember a lot of things about this little village. Been pretty good to me over the years. My great-grandson going over yonder to that Howard Vesty. The boy is smart. He went to two schools. Went to that boy Norma and over to Howard. He had to give a talk over there. He asked me, given my age and all, what would I say to the young'uns of the day if I had to speak a word to them? I had to set in my mind to that for a spell because first I thought it's above my bend. But I got thinking about all the time the Lord used me lightning rod and that tristity run through me. I'm speaking I electrocuted about maybe at least seven, eight times. I know that I work real hard, maybe at least a hundred of my hundred and ten years. I lived through two big wars, the war eighteen twelve and the Civil War. The Lord let me travel all over this big country here. I traveled from here all the way to the Rocky Mountains. I remember all the killing, twixt the north and the south. All the engines killed off and all they misery. I remember the I was a slave one while, then emancipation come and I was freed. But what I recollect best and most is the cake walking. So I guess what I got to say to all y'all who's of a mind to pay attention to anything I got to say of this year, life is what you put your mind to. You can put it to the bad or you could put it to the good. You can do the choosing. So whenever I've found troubles, or whenever trouble stop me, I put my mind to the good Lord face, and then I put my mind to cake walking. We'll be right back after these messages. to love from the eLife restaurant group in a fun new way. Drop by any time between noon and 8 p.m. for a healthier, compassionate burrito. We're located at 6904 4th Street, Northwest Washington, D.C. 20012. Do you know anyone with less than perfect credit? Or do you know anyone that simply wants to raise their score significantly? How about anyone who just wants to establish their credit? Well, look no further. 
FES can help. We are the number one restoration service in your area. We're affordable, really affordable. And we are proven to give you results. Because we all know what can happen when you have low scores, from disapprovals, turndowns, and just bad karma in your life. We fix things such as removal of late payments, charge-offs, collections, foreclosures and bankruptcies, repos, student loans, tax liens, and judgments. Now to get started, just call Ahmad Gray at 240-381-3695 or you can visit us at 6178 Oxen Hill Road, Oxen Hill, Maryland, Suite 301 or visit us on the web at www dot my fes dot net backslash a gray three and that's a g r a y three then click products then under fes protection plan enroll now give us a call today at 240-381-3695 Welcome back to the Breath of My Ancestors show. Um, again, your host, Ty Grayell, and I thank you for being here. I want you to uh, stay tuned after this broadcast because Dr. Baruch will be coming on and he'll be discussing some pertinent things with you. i um, happy to be here at eLife. I uh, want to share a little bit of the lineup with you. Uh, Rob Hall in the Hall Street Journal comes on Mondays from... Seven to nine, you need to tune in. Very important information. We have DJ Good Vibes with Good Vibrations on Wednesdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We got Kenya Pope Goodness from the Goddess Fridays from 12 to 2 p.m. So tune in to eLife Media, man. We're, we're, we're really doing some things to help shape and mold uh, the way we think in this country. And uh, we need some help with that. And I'm appreciative of eLife Media for being here and actually giving me a platform. Uh, I would be curious to know if, if anyone, whatever anyone thought of Lightning Gray. So you can call in at 240-455-5934 if you have any uh, comments or questions. Again, 240-455-5934 is the number to call if you have any comments or questions. I think it's essential that we tell our own stories because we find out that through media manipulation, we have been fed a lot of things that are absolutely are untrue and it has shaped our conditions. Uh, there's a story that I have in my book that I want to share with you and have a discussion around because it is uh, indicative of how we got here and the conditions that we're in. So this is a very, very, very short story. Again, this story was told to Lightning Gray uh, and the guy who told it to him is Lightning's voice telling the story uh, verbatim. And you got to remember that Lightning, because he was stricken or struck by, I don't know what the proper way to say that. I got a, as a wordsmith, I need to look that up, stricken or struck. I don't even know what I'm talking about. But because he was struck by Lightning so many times, he has this almost photographic memory when it comes to things. And so Lightning in his travels, met several people, and he's able to articulate their stories back to you word for word. And this is one of them. It's actually in the book, so I want to, you know, read it from the voice of lightning so you, and then talk a little bit about it. This is Thaddeus Whitmore, age 99, from Deep Hollow, Maryland. Now, you might find this year hard to swallow. But I believe that I was growed from a jigaboo tree, clear up till I was past 10 years old. See the massa, the missus, and all day young and what we played with as children. 
They always told us that we had growed from Jigaboo tree. They told us that the good Negroes what worked the fear, obeyed their master, knew they God given place and prayed to the Lord for their deliverance. They had growed from the Jigaboo tree. But the bad Negroes what would run off trying to escape and the real evil one what would talk back to the owner and rebel against their natural superiors like that there Nat Turner while they is hatched from buzzard eggs. And I believe both them tales clear up to the time I was 10 years old. I remember it well because that's the day I helped Lula May live with her firstborn son, Jacob. She's 14 and I was 10. And that's the first time I figured out that some of them white folks was liars. If you have any questions or comments about that story, call in at 240-455-5934. And the reason why I share that story is because that's what we need, uh, need to understand that we're coming from. We're coming from a mindset that was drilled in us that we are less than and we are worse than and we cannot accomplish. And that's an absolute lie. It was written into the Constitution of these United States that we are only three-fifths human. And today what we see in our society is a, you know, a bunch of people who over time are fed up with that assumption. We see our communities exploding around us because of that instilled lie that we are worse than, less than we are. That some folk are our natural superiors. We see people imploding. Uh, we see people uh, just so angry and so upset that they don't even know what they're upset about. They 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 realize on several levels that they they themselves and their forefathers and foremothers are responsible for all of the wealth and the, the glory, which is America. But they don't get a chance to participate. But they know on inherent levels, we know on inherent levels, we know uh, instinctively that we are the reason for all of this. America, in all its greatness, is great because of free labor. Free labor that we supply and what you see is people now tired of it, man. And uh, it's well, they're, they're tired of the compiled uh, oppression. Uh, the stress levels are getting to the place where uh, it's just starting to explode and implode. Uh, people are imploding, and from their implosion, we see all these explosions. And uh, we need to have more dialogue around. Uh, why these issues are. Um, when people get so stressed out, um, they they start to act out. You, you saw it with Freddie Gray. You, you, see, you see it, what, what happened in Minnesota uh, recently. You see it down in Dallas. And, you know, I'm not condoning any of that. We, we need to learn to love instead of hate. But there's a reason for all this violence. Our people are upset. Because, it's, it's, just, just think about it for a second. I'm just using an analogy. You facilitate everything. You make sure that everybody gets everything. You are the person who planted the crops. First, no, let's go back further. You till the soil. You chop down the trees. You clear the land. You tilled the soil. You planted the crops. You made sure the crops were nurtured. Then you harvested the crops. You brought the crops to, to, the, to the storehouse. You put them in the storehouse. You maintained the storehouse. But then you're not allowed to even eat from the crops. <laughs> and after a while, you know, you just get to a place where you're fed up with that scenario, fed up with that situation. And so I suggest that we're seeing that in our communities today. 
and the breath of my ancestors show um, will be doing all of its can all it can to uh, you know kind of deal with the circumstances when we think about stress think about how stress is a killer and how if you don't use mechanisms to alleviate the stress then you end up bursting just like a pipe you know it's like it's like a vacuum cleaner think about it for a second if you never clean the bag of, of a vacuum cleaner you never clean the bag you just keep sucking you know every, every, every day or every other day you use the vacuum cleaner and you get all the dirt up every single day and you never change the bag eventually either the bag burst or in some cases you start to see in most cases you start to see the same dirt that was swept up in the bag you start to smell it because it's oozing out of the bag so when you're sucking it up now it's starting to push it out and that's what we see in our society a bunch of unchanged vacuum cleaner bags who uh, are just filled up with all kind of hatred, slander, lewdness, murder, theft, all these harmful things. Just, just, And so uh, we need some platforms, people. We need some dialogue around how to get better. We need to learn how to love. We need to... Embrace the principles of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Because if we don't, <laughs> we see anarchy in the streets. And we see uh, how far this thing can go. And my suggestion is that, you know, we try to learn to love instead of hate. We got to learn to love instead of hate. And so, I guess... As I kind of wind down from this show um, today, I'll talk as we go off about a couple of things that we could actually do. And that is, we could actually start some forums around the subject matter of this whole notion of how we got to the place we are. When we talk about people don't want to visit slavery, but you have to visit slavery. You know, like, um, I, I, I was talking to a brother, and the brother said, man, how come black people always got to, and this is a brother, I always got to bring up slavery, man. Why can't we just leave that alone? And I asked him, I said, well, how, how come you don't say that about the Jews? Um, when they bring up the Jewish Holocaust, uh, we don't we don't we don't say that uh, we're the only people on earth who don't want to visit the pain that is the cause of our condition. It's the same as having cancer and not addressing the cancer. If you're diagnosed with cancer, you just don't. Walk away from it and say, oh, okay, uh, uh, or, or deny the fact that you have it. What you have to do is you have to address it. You have to either put some, some form of uh, uh, ointment on it. You got to go in and try to burn it out, uh, uh, get rid of the lesion. You got to put some, uh, some uh, chemo on it, put a laser on it. You got to do something to try to rid yourself of that cancer. Well, I'm suggesting that racism and the notion of white supremacy, chattel slavery, all of those things were tumors and a cancer on the state of America. And if we do not address the cancer, we see what's taking place in our communities. And it won't get better because cancer is cancer. It metastasizes. It spreads unless you deal with it, unless you go in and cut it out. And my suggestion in cutting it out is for us to deal with, instead of running away from 
our circumstance. Let's deal with it. I'm going to uh, c- close the show with a poem. It's about reparations because that's what we need, folks. We need to be repaired. We are suffering. Uh, we are broken as a people, broken as a nation, even though you know we might not want to deal with it. We might want to run away from it, but the fact is we are broken as a nation. Uh, when I wrote this poem, it's called, it's, the title of this poem is um, We Must Never Forget, A Poetic Case for Reparations. And you can find it in this book. And I don't mind if you go to tigrail.com and pick this book up. I think it'll be helpful to you. You can go to breathofmyancestors.com and, and pick it up at the same place. But this piece is actually in the book. And I wrote it because when you think about it, every year we're asked to remember September, I'm, I'm sorry, December 7th, 1941. Every year since I've been on earth, I remember you hearing, and we see it on commercials and everywhere, never forget the Japanese had the nerve to bomb Pearl Harbor. Never forget that. Every year we see it. Uh, every year. We asked to remember the Jewish Holocaust, more than six million people burned in ovens, Hitler, his insanity, all of that. And these are heinous crimes, and we should remember them. We should never forget them. Recently, we've been asked to never forget September 11, 2001, because they were heinous crimes, rightly so. Never forget that. You hear it all the time. Never forget that. But when it comes to chattel slavery, when it comes to Jim Crow and racism and those things, the most heinous crimes in the history of the world, we ask to forget those. And I say we must never forget. We must never forget. Denial. Is the longest river. Its current always destroys. Its shallow banks refuse to give thanks while exclusion and rejections employ. Now, America has a problem. Accepting facts as they are, facing slavery's truth is repulsive because it was uncouth and makes for an ugly memoir because you traded in human beings branded us like we were cows, then sold us like cattle, like no more than chattel. And these facts you cannot disavow. And with all those acts of evil, you reveled in celebration. And while you brutally castrated, we steadily donated. Our blood fertilized your plantations. You raped us, lynched us, butchered and burned denied our human rights. We were tarred, feathered, skinned, and spurned, and you worked us by day and by night. In every aspect of industry, you thrived off the fruits of our labor. From apples to zinc, we've been the link. Through slavery, America's been favored. Socially, educationally, economically, you flourished while we were denied. Yet, if it weren't for us, this country be dust. Its commerce would surely have died. And for this, you say you won't pay, won't even apologize. But why should you pay the debt that your forefathers let? Because you prosper from all their lies. Indeed, we must never forget. That's a phrase we should all preserve concerning the lives that were lost in the Jewish Holocaust. And that's no more than we deserve. And why should we forget ours when monuments are built to theirs? Are they superior? Are we inferior? Were theirs better than our forebears? And please remember, good people, their tragedy was on foreign soil. But the bodies of slaves are in American graves, yet few tributes to our turmoil. America, you'd best wake up. Because Lazarus has risen from the gate. Pay the debt you owe so the country can grow and learn how to love instead of hate. 
Because we want our acres and our mule. You've had yours for generations. Now it's time we were paid from the fortunes you've made. It's time for slave reparations, and we must never forget. This is Ty Grayell with the breath of my ancestors coming to you from eLife Media. See you next time. For more information, come to Safety Zone Motorcycle Riding School, where we offer BRC, basic rider courses for inexperienced riders, as well as ABRC.